invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me back to first, I'm sorry, second Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 15. We're going to begin this morning in verse number 13, just to give us a context, and then we'll move to chapter 16. Second Samuel chapter 15. Thankful that Rebbe is the member of the week. If you didn't see, she lost a tooth. And we're praying for the next one right next to it to come out too. She was showing it off this morning. So, praise the Lord. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 13. Now a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. So David said to all his servants who were there, with him in Jerusalem, arise and let us flee, for we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Now go over to chapter 16, verse number 5. When Dave, King David came to Bayerim, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, son of Gera. Coming from there, he came out, cursing continually as he came. And he threw stones at David and all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Also, Shimei said thus when he had cursed, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. So now you are caught in your own evil, because you are a bloodthirsty man. And Abishai, the son of Zeruah, said, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Please. Let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, What have I to do with you, son of Zeruiah? Or how is it your business? So let him curse. Because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and all of his servants, See how my son who came from my own body, seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse. For so the Lord has ordered him. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for this cursing this day. And as David and his men went along the road, Shimei went along on the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went, threw stones at him and kicked up dust. Now the king and all the people who were with him became weary, and so they refreshed themselves there. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on the message this morning. Our Father, we are privileged to come before you as this time of worship, to now open the scriptures and hear, thus saith the Lord. And Father, it's a moment of extreme sincerity, but also has to be one of extreme humility. We ask, Lord, that as we look at the principles of Scripture today that you're presenting us with, may we accept them, may we submit to your authority, and may we serve you with all our hearts. Father, I agree with John the Baptist when he said, I must decrease and Christ must increase. Hide this foolish preacher behind the cross of Christ, that Christ alone might be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two little brothers... Harry and James finished supper and were playing outside until bedtime. Harry hit James with a stick. Tears began to flow. Bitter words made their entrance. Charges and accusations were still being exchanged as Mommy prepared the two boys for bed. She said to them, boys... 
What would happen if either one of you died tonight and you'd never have the opportunity to ever forgive? Well, James spoke up first. He said, well, okay, I'll forgive him tonight. But if we're both alive in the morning, he better look out. <laughs> the word forgive is used in various ways in the scriptures, roughly 130 times in our English Bibles. There are two main Hebrew and two main Greek words that describe forgiveness that God uses in the scriptures. The first Hebrew word is nasak. It means the taking away or forgiveness and pardon of sin, iniquity, or transgression. This is the type of forgiveness that God grants. We can certainly emulate it as it's applied to forgiving others in Scripture. It's used in Micah 7, 11, I'm sorry, 7, 18 through 19. Who is a God like you, parting iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever, but he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will all cast your sin into the depths of the sea because of God. So the concept is that God is this one who delights in mercy and he pardons. The second Hebrew word is salach. It's used of God's offer to pardon sin of the sinners. It's different because it is only used in the context of ever God granting this type of forgiveness and using this word. So therefore, it's exclusively a divine action that man cannot do. It removes the guilt associated with moral wrongdoing. And only God can remove the guilty charge. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. He will take away that guilt. When we get to the New Testament, we come to the Greek word charizomai. It comes from the Greek word charis. Charis. I know a few people through the years by the name of charis. It is the Greek word for grace. For grace. The idea of forgiveness in this way is God's grace canceling out debt. Charizomai is used in Colossians 2, 13 through 14. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which is contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It's God's act of grace to cancel out our sin debt through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. The second Greek word used for forgiveness in the New Testament is ephiemi. Ephiemi. It means to dismiss something. To let it go. Well, this is what God does when we confess our sins. He won't bring it up again. It's gone. 1 John 1 9 explains it. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's gone. As far as the east is from the west, He so far removes our sin, He lets it go. So the true value of forgiveness is found in God's biblical method. Forgiveness is an action releasing someone of deserved punishment. Now, forgiveness is not an emotion. It is the intentional act of granting absolution towards a person that simply does not deserve it. Anything less is not forgiveness. So when Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 says, And be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake forgives you. Are you thankful that God does not hold 
grudges. Wouldn't we be in serious trouble if God did hold a grudge? After all, isn't it you who nailed Jesus to the cross? I am so thankful God does not hold grudges. Romans 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk, after, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How much grudge does God hold? None. There is no condemnation. In 2 Samuel chapter 16, King David had to flee from Absalom as Absalom had taken the kingdom by force. This is a very difficult and dark time in David's life. But it's in this moment that we see some goodness too. So I want to examine this altercation that took place between David and a man named Shimei that really teaches us a lesson on forgiveness. My proposition to you this morning is this. Forgive others as fully and quickly as you expect God to forgive you. Forgive others as fully and quickly as you expect God to forgive you. So a moment ago, I just quoted 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. When do you expect God to forgive you of that sin? The moment you confess it to him. Because that's his character. Shouldn't you be using the same act of forgiveness towards others? I want to examine how God desires for us to use his forgiveness. To walk in his steps. And so first, we're going to see that David had an opportunity to practice forgiveness and grace. And then we're going to learn just how he employed his forgiveness. So let's first look at this opportunity that was presented to David. David was presented with an opportunity to practice forgiveness. So look at 2 Samuel 16, 5 and 6 again. When David came to Bar-Urim, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, son of Gera, coming out from there. He came out cursing continuously, and as he came, and he threw stones at David and all the servants of the king David and all the people, and the mighty men were on his right and on his left hand. You know, we discover right away that Shimei is just really not a nice guy. He's not. He's mean. He's cruel. He's disrespectful. He's rude. He's arrogant. And he's antagonistic. And there's probably a lot of other things that you could add. Why? Well, Shimei is jealous. He is related to King Saul, according to verse 5. He doesn't want David as king. He wants his family member as king. And so the first thing we see Shimei do is actually launch a verbal attack towards King David. So as David is leaving Jerusalem seeking cover, Shimei begins cursing at him. Now, Shimei didn't use curse words that you would think of in English, but rather this concept is that he's calling David worthless. He's worthless. Or in other words... David, you are a disgrace to Israel and to God. It's re he's really reveling in the fact that David lost his throne to Absalom. We won't turn here yet, but over in 1 Kings chapter 2, David <laughs> describes these cursings as grievous cursings. I can't be dogmatic about this, but a few commentators point out that that root word of the word grievous actually means to call down sickness or to cause to be sick. Some commentators wonder if it's possible that Shimei was using a sort of witchcraft to call down hexes towards against David. That's a possibility. But he also goes on and says, David, you are a bloody man. Well, that's modern for you're a murderer. You're a murderer. The words 
must have struck David to the heart. David's at a very low and tender point. He just lost his kingdom. Is David a murderer? Yes. Now, I'm not sure how much Shimei or the men around David knew, but did David know in his heart that he killed Uriah so he could have Bathsheba? So that part is actually true. And I think that actually causes a conviction in David's heart and helps him not just get angry at the false charges. Now, the King James says that Shimei calls David a son of Belial, Belial at the end of verse 7. The New King James uses the word rogue. It means someone who is good for nothing. Someone who is good for nothing. I don't think it's a satanic reference specifically in this section of Scripture. But he's saying, David, you're a worthless individual. Now let's pause there for a moment. Is that true? Who is David? He's God's chosen man. He's God's chosen king. Is he worthless? Who in this congregation this morning is worthless? Which one of you is more valuable than the other? Do you know how much you are all worth? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is your value. You are infinitely valuable. And I'm not trying to just boost your ego. I'm trying to teach you how much your God loves you. Whether you accept him as savior or not, the love for you is still there that he gave his son. So Shimei is not correct. David is not a worthless individual. Isn't it interesting? How Shimei says worthless things. One is true, but there are three lies in verse number eight. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. The concept here is that God is now enacting revenge on David for killing Saul and his family. Well, that's a lie. Saul committed suicide. And his sons were killed in battle against the Philistines. David had nothing to do with that. And now he goes on and says, And the Lord delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. Well, that's a lie too. Absalom took the throne by rebellion, and he is not God's appointed king. He never will be God's appointed king. Did God allow that to happen? Yes, indeed. There are lessons that David had to learn. But this is not God's king. Absalom lives in rebellion, and so does Shimei. So Shimei is the one, really, who is saying things that have no value. He's the kind of man who kicks others when they're down. And David's kingdom and his family are in absolute shambles. David is vulnerable in this moment. It doesn't get much lower than kicking a man when he's down. Isn't it interesting that those who are good for nothing are usually the ones that tell everyone else they're good for nothing? Uh, again, his soul needs to be saved, and every soul is worth the cost of Christ on the cross. But really, this man has nothing of value to give King David because of his rebellious heart. Shimei's a gross character in Scripture. So there's this verbal assault. One part is true. Three lies. But it's not done yet. Now we have the physical assault. What does David receive? Well, twice here in the passage we're told that Shimei throws rocks. Verse 13 says, He casts the dust over him. Most likely this is making clouds of dust over David's head. Or, as we would say if you're on... Uh, above someone below, raining down dirt on their heads. It's a purpose of humiliation. A king is never in that position. 
And so Shimei is rude and insulting, but to compound the problem, he's not doing this just to any old Israelite. He's doing this to the king of Israel, God's appointed king. So there's a verbal attack, and there's a physical attack, and David is an innocent victim here. Have you ever had someone wrongfully attack you? You know, Charles Spurgeon recounted the story of a lady who confronted him after he was done preaching because she did not like the preacher's tie. And she asked him if she could cut it off. It's pretty unfair, isn't it? No, none of you are cutting my tie off this day. So Spurgeon agreed. He was very gracious. And he said, under one condition, you can cut my tie off. If I can cut something of yours off, I do not like. And the lady said, that's fair. So she proceeded to cut the tie off of the preacher after scissors were retrieved. And it was now the preacher's turn, and Spurgeon said, Okay, madam, stick out your tongue. <laughs> she wasn't very nice. We all have people who say hurtful things, and some even now escalate that into physical violence against us. Now, moms and dads, we teach our children, sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt me, Right? still hurts. And sometimes, to be transparent, I'd rather have a broken bone. You know, my dad used to say, oh, Tim, you need to be like water off a duck's back. I'm not a duck. I have feelings too. Words hurt. Have you ever been kicked when you are down? Have you ever been lied about, slandered, isn't it interesting that Satan knows the right time to attack you? David was vulnerable. It's when you're tired, you're anxious, you're discouraged, where Satan is now prone to lay the attack down, and it hurts. What's your reaction to such violence, whether physical or verbal? Can I just tell you I love Abishai? Look at chapter 16, verse 9. And Abishai, the son of Zeruai, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord of the king? Please, let me go over and take off his head. I like Abishai. Your majesty, may I please give Shimei's mouth a relief by removing the great load of unused space that's sitting in between his shoulders? That's not in the King James, by the way. David's presented with the opportunity to do away with Shimei in a moment's notice. Would he have been wrong for doing so? Probably not. David could have ordered Abishai to execute Shimei, and no one would have even questioned it. No citizen has the right to humiliate a king like this man. But instead, what is David's reaction? He chose to give grace and forgiveness. And David now teaches us that it is wise to forgive as quickly as you expect God to forgive you. So let's see how David chose forgiveness over revenge. Number two, David chose forgiveness over revenge. He had the opportunity but now he had to make the choice. What's his immediate response? Verse 10. Abishai, it's not your business. Let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, curse David. And then shall say, why have you done so? This is interesting. David says, leave him alone. God has allowed this moment in time to be used for his good and his glory. Oh, that we could look at difficulty and trials like David did in that moment. Maybe if he is right, 
It is what it is, and allow God to iron it out. But you know, Abishai, if he is wrong, the Lord will work it out in his time and in his way. Isn't that an amazing response from King David here? It's completely spiritual in nature, and it is not natural. Instead of getting angry, David listened to see if there was any truth in what was being said. You know, typically when we are confronted with people like Shimei, we have an outrage reaction and then we go into self-defense mode. We get offended at the person's insults and then we choose to ignore any message coming from that person, even if there is a grain of truth in what they are saying. That's not what David did. Is there a grain of truth in what Shimei is telling David? You are a murderer. Is that true? It is true. Of course, Shimei doesn't point out that David had God's forgiveness after repenting and being restored. And most likely, Shimei doesn't even know about that taking place. But the lies, this is the hard part. Because David is slandered about things that never happened. He didn't kill Saul. Absalom wasn't given any special blessings by God. Acting like David takes grace, it takes love, and it takes mercy. And even though that David is to the one of the lowest points in his life, this is one of the highest watermarks in David's life defined by self-control. And it teaches us a lot of lessons. So what are you supposed to do when you are attacked? Don't you just want to get even? Are you supposed to go after your pound of flesh? When someone hurts you, shouldn't you just hurt them back twice as hard so they'll never hurt you again so they learn their lesson? Isn't that what man is supposed to do? Well, that's what our flesh wants. But is that what David did? No, that's not what David did. He simply says, the Lord's in control. What if the Lord sent him? To be a messenger to us. Let the Lord have his way. As a child, we used to sing the song. Let the Lord have his way in your life every day. There's no rest. There's no peace until the Lord has his way. That's it. That's exactly what David is saying. He placed the matters in God's hands because God knows the truth. God knows the motives behind the attacks that are being launched. God knows how to settle the score, and God doesn't need your help to make things even. God also knows the grace that it's going to take to get past the hurt. And God desires for you to act like Jesus. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet open not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. It's no wonder why this man is called the man after God's own heart. So the next time that you are cursed at attack, threatened, lied about, pause to consider what God wants you to do. You can step outside of God's will and handle it yourself your own way or by force, or you can take the high road and leave it in God's hands. But if you don't take the high road, just understand that that hurt that you have in your heart, well, that can fester into something much worse. Anger, hatred, bitterness, destruction. So in this chapter, David's story with Shimei ends just as quickly as it started. By verse 14, we're done. However, that's not the end of the story. Now let's turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 19.
Absalom's dead. We're going to see that story next Sunday. David is returning back to his throne in Jerusalem. And guess who we run into again three chapters later? Good old Shimei. Chapter 19, verse 16. And Shimei, the son of Gera, Benjamite, who's from Baurim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. Oh, great, here we go again. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and 15 sons and 20 servants with him. And they went over the Jordan before the king. Are you ready for this? Is it going to be ugly? Then a ferry boat went across to carry over the king's household to do what he thought was good. Now Shimei, the son of Gareth, fell down before the king when he had crossed the Jordan. And he said, Do not let my Lord impute iniquity to me, or remember what wrong your servant did on the day that my Lord the king left Jerusalem, that the king should take it to heart. For I, your servant, know that I have sinned. Therefore, here I am, the first to come today in all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my Lord the king. I love Abishai. Verse 21. But Abishai, Mr. Consistency, son of Zeruiah, answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this? Because he cursed the Lord's anointed. I love this guy. But look what David says. Abishai, it's not your business. What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, that you should be adversaries to me today. Shall any man be put to death today in Israel? For do I not know that today I am king over Israel? Therefore the king said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king swore to him. It's really fascinating that the king's response demonstrates an act of grace that Shimei just did not deserve. David's response when faced with the opportunity to forgive, is to have a willingness of heart to say, you are forgiven. That's not easy to do, is it? What's interesting is, even though Abishai is consistent, King David is consistent. It's the same answer these months later, after the rebellion has been put down, the anger could have been still there. The heart is still raw. The cursing was still said, but yet David turns and seeks restoration. I think David understands that the very best of us, even though we can be spiritual, we're still just sinful men. Every one of us. All have sinned against God. And yet God has a spirit of forgiveness when? Always. When we come to ask him. And it's that same principle that we have to live our lives with and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And if you are not willing to obey God, you are either not a believer or you are seriously backslidden. 1 John 4.20 If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? So holding grudges and seeking revenge are never justified even when the offender does not ask for forgiveness. Vengeance is always God's. It is perfectly reasonable to hate a person's sin. But if someone has wronged you and refuses to ask forgiveness, you are to treat them as God treats you, happy to give mercy. What did Christ say on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
So who at that cross came and asked for forgiveness for crucifying Jesus Christ in that moment? Well, I think we find one, a Roman soldier now proclaims, truly that was the Son of God. That's a sign of belief. Now, only those who ask forgiveness for forgiveness are able to obtain the full benefits of forgiveness. Is everyone saved because Jesus died? No. But yet, Jesus still died on the cross, not for your sins alone, but also for the sins of the world, so that all have access to salvation. God is quick and delights in giving mercy. Should you not have the same spirit? Let me close this morning just with a word of wisdom. Forgiveness is not permission for the offender to keep being offensive. Right? The forgiver is not the doormat for the forgiven. Isaiah 55, 7, I read earlier, says this. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. But what if the wicked doesn't change his way and return to the Lord? You know, 2 Samuel chapter 19 isn't the last interaction of David and Shimei. We have to go to 1 Kings chapter 2 to see that. Would you turn there with me? First Kings chapter 2, David is now on his deathbed. Solomon is taking the throne. The father's instruction is now being given to a son. First Kings 2 verse 8. And see... You have with you Shimei, the son of Gera, Benjamin from Baurim, who cursed me with a malicious curse in the day that I went to Mahanaim. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan. And I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with a sword. Now look at verse 9. Now therefore, do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man, and know what you ought to do to him. But bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. Uh-oh. But pastor, this is a sermon about forgiveness. And David changes his mind? Well, that's one interpretation of the passage. David is now giving this instruction to Solomon, and he gives Solomon a warning. He's saying, listen, Shimei has been forgiven. I made that oath at the Jordan that day. But he also needs to keep on doing what is right and correct, just like Isaiah commands in chapter 55, let the wicked forsake his way. And David gives advice to Solomon to keep Shimei close to Solomon, And I want to point out, this is what Solomon does. And Solomon doesn't go and just kill Shimei because David says so. That's not the concept. Go down to verse 36. Then the king, now this is Solomon, sent and called for Shimei and said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and dwell there, and do not go out from there anywhere. Well, this is what his dad told him to do. You keep your enemies close. For it shall be on the day that you go out and cross the book Kidron, know for certain you shall surely die. Your blood shall be on your head. And, and so the question is, if 
Shimei lives under the king's rule and does what this king tells him to do, when will Shimei die? Natural causes. Old age, whatever it happens to be. And verse 38, And Shimei said to the king, The saying is good. I agree. I will submit my will to the kings. As the Lord my king has said, so your servant will do. So Shimei dwelt in Jerusalem many days. Now it happened at the end of three years that two slaves of Shimei ran away to Achish, the son of Makkah, king of Gath. And they told Shimei, saying, Look, your slaves are in Gath. So Shimei arose, saddled his donkey, and went to Achish at Gath to seek his slaves. Shimei went and brought his slaves from Gath. Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and had come back. Then the king sent and called for Shimei to say to him, Did I not make you swear by the Lord? And warn you, saying, Know for certain that on the day that you go out and travel anywhere, you shall surely die. And you said to me, The word I have here is good. Why then have you not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandment that I gave you? The king said, Moreover, Shimei, you know, as your heart acknowledged, all the wickedness that you did to my father David. Therefore, the Lord will return you your wickedness on your own head. The King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and he struck him down and he died. Thus the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. I have a question for you. Why did Shimei die? Because David orders execution? Or Shimei broke a covenant that he made in the sight of God. It's number two, isn't it? I think what David as a king is doing is he's giving wisdom and instruction to his son. This is someone you have to watch. I suspect there is more to the story, Solomon. Yes, he repented, but I'm still having a hard time trust this fellow. And so it seems harsh to now execute Shimei for breaking his word. However, the danger Solomon is facing as a new king is that Shimei could once again be consorting with a king of Gath of the Philistines to overthrow Solomon's rule. And so there is this rule that is now made, and it's not an unfair rule because Shimei submits himself and says, this is good, I will do this. I will have a long and peaceful life in Jerusalem, except he did not keep his word. Why Solomon gave Shimei land and a blessing of a home in Jerusalem, not far from his own. Shimei, I promise to be above reproach and to never leave Jerusalem. But he broke his promise and he paid the ultimate price. I do not see this as an act of non-forgiveness from David. I see it as Shimei making his own bed. Those who have been forgiven do not have a blank check to abuse those who have granted forgiveness. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And Shimei's sin was that of rebellion against his king, for which he was fully granted permission to now have forgiveness. With the condition that he not do it again. But he couldn't help himself. He disrespected his king's authority and he rebelled for a second time. And he paid with his life. You know, the flip side of forgiveness is for the forgiven to now be faithful. How are you doing with forgiveness this morning? Are you one that delights, like God, in giving mercy and forgiveness? During the first three years of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln suffered many bungling generals who failed to give the Union the victory. McClellan and Pope and Burnside and Hooker, they all failed. But in the summer of 1863, General Meade crushed Lee at Gettysburg. 
Lee and his army needed to retreat back across the Potomac to regroup. The only problem was Potomac was at flood stage, and crossing it would be very difficult for the army. So sensing victory, Lincoln ordered by telegraph and a special messenger so Meade would get it to attack immediately. Not form a war council to develop a plan, just simply attack. General Meade disobeyed. He formed a war council and delayed to make a battle plan, and Lee slipped across the Potomac with his army to safety. Lincoln was crushed. In anger, he composed this letter to General Meade. My dear General, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within our easy grasp, and to have closed upon him would, in connection with our other late successes, have ended the war. As it is, the war will now be prolonged indefinitely. If you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, how can you possibly do so south of the river when you can take with you very few, no more than two-thirds of the force that you need in hand? It would be unreasonable to expect, and I don't expect, that you can now effect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed and immeasurably because of it. Those are some harsh words. But you know what? General Meade never read that letter. President Lincoln never sent it. It was found in Lincoln's papers following his death. What's interesting is that when Meade came to meet Lincoln, he was very well of the president's displeasure. But the day after Meade wrote in his journal, yesterday, I received an order to repair to Washington to see the president. The president was as he always is, very considerate and kind. He found no fault with my operations, although it was very evident he was disappointed that I had not gotten the battle out of Lee. Isn't it interesting to see the backdrop? I believe President Lincoln was a very godly man and practiced forgiveness towards Meade. Well, how about you? Has someone verbally attacked you? Has someone physically attacked you? I'm not saying that you need to be that person's doormat for the rest of eternity. Not at all. But how are you going to show Christ to that person? How are you going to pray for that person? And how are you going to be quick to mercy and love that person just as God loves that person. And you say, Pastor, that is impossible. You are right. In your flesh, it is totally impossible. In our flesh dwells no good thing. But friends, let me close on this thought. But with God, all things are possible. Forgive others as quickly as you expect God to forgive you. Father, I pray that you would use this message in the hearts of our members and attendees here this day and those who are watching online. This is not an easy message to put into practice. It's much more fun and gratifying to find rebuke and fighting and revenge and putting ourselves ahead. And that's our natural reaction when put into conflict. But Father, help us to be like Jesus Christ. As a lamb that was led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. And then when he did, he said this, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lord, there are folks in our congregation this morning that are struggling with forgiveness. They've been attacked, they've been slandered, they've been verbally abused, they've been physically abused. hurts. Help them to have the spirit of Father forgive them. They truly don't know what they're doing. And Lord we pray for those that have unrepentantly attacked and abused that you would get a hold of their hearts too so that the reconciliation 
of grace and mercy can be brought upon them. Lord, we pray that we would be Christ-like and we would forgive others as quickly as we expect you to forgive us. In Jesus' name.